Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. Tonight we continue with our series, Surviving Day School. Reporter Brittany Gio speaks to a survivor who lost two aunties who attended a day school in Euclid, British Columbia, and a warning that the material may be upsetting for some viewers. Nestled between rugged beaches and the Pacific Rim National Park, the coastal community of Hitasu is home to day school survivor Donna Jack. She's lived all her life in the Euclid First Nation on Vancouver Island. In the 1960s, Jack spent two years at the Euclid Indian Day School, but the details are difficult for her to share. Suppressing is the worst thing for me. My daughter says that you need to talk about it more because it is all suppressed all my life of just knowing you have to be quiet about things. And that's what we do is suppress things. We're just going to bury it until it's safe. And I think I've done that all my life. And now I think about it. And uh, when it started come up, coming up, I just wanted to cry. And I thought about my parents. An estimated 200,000 Indigenous children were forced to attend Indian day schools. And like residential schools, the goal was to assimilate. My sister and brother said they used to get a strap. Maybe it was because they were speaking the language, but they weren't allowed to talk about it. APTN News discovered that 200 Indigenous children died while attending day schools across the country. In an access to information request that covered 46 of the more than 700 schools. The children's deaths are casually noted by school officials in student nominal cards, memos, and principal reports. Jack's parents were both survivors of the residential school system and deeply feared for their children's well-being. My father, when he heard a plane coming in, he told my older brother, you go bring your sisters into the forest. I don't want you coming out until I tell you to come out. And that would have been just over here, because we lived there and just over there. The forest was there and he said, you bring them out there and I don't want you coming home until I tell you that the plane with the Indian agent is gone, because he didn't want us taken away from here. The documents reveal striking similarities between Jack's school and residential schools. Often, they were called education centers and agencies. Like residential schools, they were run by non-Indigenous religious orders. And they too used Indian agents to enforce the rules. It's unclear just how many children died while attending the Euclid Indian Day School. But these documents reveal children as young as three years old died while attending. And like residential schools, there are children missing who died during the school year, including two of Donna Jack's aunts. Some sisters that I never knew, she told me the names, and I said, I don't see any graves up here of my mother's family. I see her father's, but I believe they died during the school time. I don't know how or why, but, you know, shouldn't they be buried here? If they're from here, that's where everybody is brought home. These people weren't brought home, so no records of what happened to them. She says the news of the deaths at day schools is incredibly difficult to hear. The Euclid school closed in 1966, but Jack says the day school grounds also need to be searched for the children who never came home. For them to be that scared about things and being told to be quiet about it, that tells you a lot. And I think they should search everywhere there was one. It's as hard as it is, I am still weeping inside. That's the hardest part, is getting past that. Brittany Yu, APTN National News, Winnipeg. The Hope for Wellness hotline can be reached at 1-855-242-3310 or online at hopeforwellness.com. We'll have part three of this series tomorrow night. 
Dozens of recommendations came out of the coroner's report looking at Joyce Eshaquan's death at a Joliet hospital. But no one's been appointed yet to oversee them. Today came good news. The regional health authority overseeing Joliet Hospital says they're actively addressing internal problems identified during the inquest. The director of the Lano Dier Health Board says they've hired two cultural liaisons at Joliet and will hire another to handle specific complaints from Indigenous patients. There are also Indigenous reps now working with board administration and more than 12,000 employees took the board's cultural sensitivity course. A longer, more thorough workshop developed with Manawan First Nation will be offered soon. Manawan's Grand Chief sees progress. Très, très heureux de voir les parents de Joyce ce matin qui venaient consulter à l'hôpital alors que ces gens-là, pour il y a quelques mois, ne voulaient absolument rien savoir de mettre les pieds dans cet établissement. C'est dire, c'est vous dire à quel point est-ce que les efforts ont été déployés et des ressources ont été mobilisées pour euh, aller chercher cette confiance, renouveler cette confiance des gens vis-à-vis de l'établissement de Joliette. After a week of testimony from 25 witnesses at the Rodney Levi coroner's inquest and after six hours of deliberation, the jury still could not reach a decision into the nature of the death of the police fatal shooting of Rodney Levi. Angel Moore reports from Miramachi, New Brunswick. Today, coroner John Evans expressed surprise that the jury could not determine if the police fatal shooting of Rodney Levi was homicide, suicide, or undetermined. Levi was killed by RCMP Constable Haight on the evening of June 12, 2020, at the home in Sunnybrook, New Brunswick. Before deliberations, the five-member jury was instructed not to assign blame. Evans said it was significant that more than one witness testified that Levi said, you're going to have to put a bullet in me. Evans also said had the officers cleared the scene of bystanders and given Levi more space, the outcome may have been different. The jurors will convene tomorrow. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Miramichi, New Brunswick. Thanks, Angel. To Alberta, where four men have been sentenced to nine years each in an Edmonton courtroom for the stabbing death of 27-year-old Kevin Yellowbird. Yellowbird was stabbed 10 times. His body was found on a rural road north of Edmonton in 2017. Four men, Tyler Fisher, Skyler McGilvery, Sterling McGilvery, and Cougar Farford, pled guilty to manslaughter in Yellowbird's death. Prosecutors say they could not prove which of the men did the stabbing, which is why the charge was downgraded to manslaughter. In Saskatchewan, for the second time since July, the Shoal Lake and Red Earth Cree Nations have been evacuated due to fires and smoke. The fires, which had been burning for months, is south of the communities and has grown in size to 50,000 hectares. Smoke has reached as far as Edmonton. Shoal Lake Cree Nation Chief Marcel Head says the Saskatchewan government is not making the two communities a priority, putting firefighting resources elsewhere. Everybody was just, uh, I guess, busy with uh, fighting fires uh, in different place, places of uh, Saskatchewan. But this was, uh, I think, you know, it, it was not much of a priority to the government, uh, provincial government, uh, uh, throughout the summer. Now that, uh, you know, the, it's, the fire has grown uh, significantly and, uh, you know, I think it's, uh, it's time, you know, the provincial government uh, gets serious about this, uh, this fire. Elena Zabomswin has added another honor to her resume. A story more coming up after the break. Welcome back. It was one week ago that we marked the first national day for truth and reconciliation a new federal holiday for Canadians to reflect on the legacy of residential schools. But as Sarah Connors tells us, September 30th isn't exactly a day off for many, causing some people to cry foul. Here at the 
here in the Yukon. September 30th was a statutory holiday for federal and territorial workers, banks and schools. But for private sector employees, it wasn't a guaranteed day off. Similar to most provinces across the country, it was up to private employers to give employees the day off. That's prompted the Yukon Human Rights Commission to call on the territorial government to ensure all Indigenous Yukoners get the day off in the future. The director of the commission says the holiday can even be a burden for Indigenous people who don't have the day off. So where uh, employees uh, who are members of these communities in, in the private sector will have to find and make arrangements for childcare because the schools are closed. I think that's just, um, in my opinion, half measures. Betty Nippy Albright is a residential school survivor in opposition MLA for the Saskatchewan provincial government, which did not recognize September 30th as a provincial holiday. She says everyone in Saskatchewan should get the day off to reflect, not just those who work for the federal government. They want to have a paid holiday. When the provincial government um, is not listening to the um, citizens of this province, it speaks volumes of their uh, commitment to reconciliation. While the province did recognize the day and lowered flags at half-mast at government buildings, Nippy Albright says she'd like to see treaty and Métis flags flown at government buildings as well. If they want to truly talk about reconciliation, they have to uh, stop giving lip service and stop doing things half measures. She adds more needs to be done by governments to truly advance reconciliation efforts. There's loss that needs to happen. So September 30th needs to be that day where we as citizens of this province reflect and and look at how can we push our legislators to do the right thing. Meanwhile, Tatani says the commission just recently learned the Yukon government plans to make the day one where all Yukoners can take time to commemorate it. We do understand that they have committed uh, to making sure that next year is different. Um, and we are happy about that. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. Alan Azabomswin has received a long list of awards over her distinguished career. And earlier this week, the Abenaki filmmaker was honored once again, this time with the 13th Glenn Gould Prize. At a ceremony that lit up the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, Elena McDougall has that story. And I think she's really inspiring the next generation of Indigenous filmmakers and the past generations as well. It was a captivating tribute and evening for Alan Isobomswin, with the facade of the Royal Ontario Museum illuminated in tribute to the acclaimed artist and the Glenn Gould Foundation awarded her a $100,000 prize. The Glenn Gould Prize recognizes a unique lifetime of enriching the human condition through the arts. Obomswin is known for her films, Ganesatage, 270 Years of Resistance, The Incident at Restigouche, and recently her short film, To Honor Marie Sinclair, debuted at the Toronto International Film Festival. Reflecting on her work, Obomswin said times have changed. It's a very, very, very different time. It's nice uh, for me to see and hear uh, Canadians in general being very curious and really want to see justice to our people. And uh, so there's a feeling of being welcome everywhere. So it's a big change. When she sees the work young Indigenous artists are completing, Obamswin said she feels confident about the future. Uh, It's very... uh, makes me feel less worry. So I say, oh, when I die, there's all these young people that are going to take over. They are already. And it's a very comforting feeling for me to see that. And I'm amazed about what everybody is doing. She presented Ojibwe documentarian Sarah Anderson Gardner with the Glenn Gould Protégé Award for her film, Becoming Nakaset. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's a very big honor and I feel very grateful and there's honestly not a lot of words for how I feel right now. 
Metis filmmaker Terrell Calder premiered her light show, Seeds, the art and life of Alanisa Bomswin on the museum's facade. Seeds paid stunning tribute through animation and Obamswin's music, which could be heard on a Toronto street following the ceremony. Seeds, the art of Alanisa Bomswin will run nightly to October 17th from 8 to 10 p.m. with three shows on the hour. Elena McDougall, ABCM National News, Toronto. And a huge congrats to Alan Ace, who has made more films than some people will see in their lifetimes. Well, a new season of Nation to Nation gets underway in just a few moments' time. Here's host Brett Forrester with a look at what's in store. The Minister of Justice and Attorney General is one of Canada's most powerful people. So many Indigenous people had high hopes when Jody Wilson-Raybould assumed the post in 2015. Four years later, she found herself booted from the Liberal caucus in the wake of the SNC-Lavalin affair. Now, she's spilling the details in a new political memoir. I speak with Jody Wilson-Raybould about what needs to change in Ottawa. And David Chartrand, president of the Manitoba Métis Federation, joins me to explain why his organization left the Métis National Council. Those interviews are coming up right after the news. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. And Dave Menzies happened upon a massive hornet's nest near La Brokerie, Manitoba. Thanks for sharing this absolutely frightening shot, Dave. Uh, good for you for getting that close. So you didn't see me anywhere near that. Send us your pictures for a chance to be featured on APTN National News. You can email them to share at aptn.ca along with the location and description. Let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, 15 with showers for Halifax, 16 in Fredericton. 5 in Kujuak, a chance of snow, and 6 in Nain. Sunny and 22 in Montreal, 21 and sunny in Shibugamu. 18 with showers in Sault Ste. Marie, sun's out and 21 in North Bay. 18 with rain in Thunder Bay, showers and 21 in Sioux Lookout. Rain and 13 for God's Lake. 14 for Norway House in the Paw. Rain and 19 for Winnipeg. 19 with no rain in Dauphin. Sunny and 18 for Regina and Saskatoon. 17 in North Battleford. 9 in Uranium City. 12 and sunny in Buffalo Narrows. In Northern Alberta, 9 in High Level. 11 in Grand Prairie. 14 in Sunny in Edmonton. 15 in Lethbridge. Showers and 13 for Vancouver and Victoria, 15 in Kamloops. 9 in Prince George, rain and 6 in Dease Lake. 0 with snow in Old Crow, 5 with rain for Whitehorse. Rain and 5 for Yellowknife, snow and 5 in Norman Wells. Minus 3 with flurries for Saks Harbor, 2 in Cloudy and Politic. 6 in Chesterfield, 8 in Whale Cove, minus 2 with snow in Resolute, plus 3 with snow in Joe Haven. Some big news out of the National Hockey League today as Montreal Canadiens star goaltender Carey Price is taking a leave of absence from the team. Price has voluntarily entered the NHL Player Assistance Program for an unspecified reason. The assistance program helps players deal with mental health, substance abuse issues and other matters. Price's wife Angela posted on Instagram saying Kerry is making the best decision for himself and their family and that asking for help is not just okay but encouraged. In an emotional press conference today, Canadians general manager Mark Ber Bergevin said Price would be away for a minimum 30 days and possibly longer, but added he expects him to return this season. Kerry's story is something that uh, on the personal side I think it should all not affect us, but make us realize that you know these young kids, have, these young players have all have... Uh, they're human beings, so regardless of the the compensation you get at the end of the year, you you have a, you have a family, and that that's your living. So uh, he gets all the support, and uh, hopefully we'll have him back soon. 
The Royal Canadian Mint has released the first of three coins celebrating Indigenous stories from across Canada. Three coins will be issued annually and share the stories of Inuit, First Nations and Métis people and the role they play in sharing traditional knowledge with new generations. The first coin's design was made by Enoch artist Jason Sikwa. It tells the tale of a beautiful Enoch who became the sea goddess and mother of all marine mammals after she was thrown into the ocean, although the story varies across the Inuit regions. Across Inuit and Nunungat, uh, there's some inter iteration of the story that's always been told. But it's uh, also important to the, the outside world to um, know a bit of our oral traditions and, and where we come from. It's uh, important to share knowledge, to, to let people know that we're still here, um, that we remember the stories that have been told and that we're not going anywhere. I have those same headphones. On the season premiere of APTN Investigates, Robert J. Ballantyne and Christopher Reed open up the pages of Canada's colonial playbook, revealing some of the tactics Canada uses to delay and deny Indigenous justice. Let's take a look at the colonial playbook airing tomorrow night. We want to begin with a warning tonight. Some information may stir up or trigger unpleasant feelings or thoughts. The remains of 215 children. It was devastating to, to know that there's 215. The work around residential schools is the root of so many of the other systemic issues that Indigenous people face today. You don't just, oops, I, I created a genocidal machine known as residential schools. There's a lot of thought, planning, processes. That's colonialism. Taking away resources, taking away opportunities, taking away families. We are not fighting Indigenous kids in court. And yet that next week, uh, we were going to federal court to defend children against the government of Canada. This is exactly according to the colonial playbook. We now know their plays. How do we respond now? Looks good. You can catch the colonial playbook on APTN Investigates on Friday. That's tomorrow night right here after our newscast. Great to have all the shows back this week. And that is all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Thursday. You can find much more over on our website, aptnnews.ca. Stick around nation to nation with Brett Forrester is next, and boy, does it look good. I'm Dennis Ward. Have a great night. We'll see you back here tomorrow.